I thought, what if you and I had a GPS system by which it was directed right to Almighty God, and we'd ask God to give us the way to live, the way to life. We'd say, God, I know you're there. I'm sending you this message straight to your throne room. Give to me, give to us the way to live, the way to life. Would you be interested in the answer? I know exactly what the answer would be. In the Bible, he talks about the broad way that leads to destruction. He talks about the narrow way that leads to life. And his son Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Lord, show us the way we are to live the way from here to life forever. Now, we come to the 13th chapter, and it is a parenthesis. It is within a parenthesis. Look at it, if you would, if you have your Bibles with you. We go to the 13th chapter, and we go to the last verse of the 12th chapter. Paul says... And yet I will show you the most excellent way. That's our word, right? Way. I'll show you the excellent way. That's one end of it. The other end of it is the first verse of chapter 14. Follow the way of love. So you have 1 Corinthians 13 defines and tells us about love. And it says, find the most excellent way And then there's all the chapter on love. The other end, the parentheses, it says the the master way, the excellent way is love. So we've got to talk about love. Love is like sex. We talk about it. We think we know everything about it, but we really don't. I'm going to have several series of messages on that, so hang on. Bring your asbestos suits with you. But love is so confusing to most people in the modern world. And it especially was there in Corinth, and it also is today. You find some people say in the Greek language they had nine different words for love. Some say eight, some say six, various various understandings of love. But in the Bible, there are only three different words used for love. Eros is used in the Old Testament. That is that sensual love. In the New Testament, we find the word phileo, friendship love. I love you as a friend. And then you find that big, broad, pregnant, magnificent word called agape. And that word, according to J.I. Packer, is almost, almost unique. That's not really good English, but I think it fits. It is almost unique to Christianity. It is a sacrificial love. It is a total serving love. It is a total unselfish love. It is a love willing to lay down your life. It is a love that will go to any extreme at any time and any place for anybody. Agape is not an emotional thing. It is an action thing. That's where we get confused. How do we get agape? Man, I found in 1 John a very little verse there that says when we obey and live by the word of God, we receive God's love, agape, and we are complete. And we're going to run to the word complete in just a minute. We obey God and receive this kind of supernatural love. It's not such an emotional thing. It's something that we can do. We can practice. We're motivated by. When Christ comes into our life, the Holy Spirit dwells in our life, we just begin to overflow with this kind of 
selfless love and is supernatural. And this is what Paul describes to us magnificently in the little parentheses there in the 13th chapter. Look at it, and it tells, first of all, that love is indispensable, and Paul begins by talking about himself in the first person. Look at it. If I, Paul, speak with the tongues of men or of angels and do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, if I speak in the tongues, in Corinth, they had people all over the world. They spoke every language, every dialect. Paul said, if I had the ability to speak in whatever language, whatever tongue somebody would have, man, that would be something. I could communicate eloquently like that. He said, even if I had the language of angels, and by the way, all of this is hyperbole. It's an exaggeration to get everybody's attention, to, to wake everybody up. Paul was saying, if I had this kind of ability to orate and speak in any language at any time, but I don't have this agape love in my life, all that I'm doing is a gong, boom, 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 are clashing symbols. In other words, it's just noise, right? If I, if I don't have love, though I have this great ability, it's just noise. Then he goes on, he said, he said, another if is there. He speaks up, he said, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. What's he saying there? He's saying if I could understand Gnosticism, big in that day, if I could understand mysterious things about God and all the workings of the world, he said, that would be good, but if I don't have love, it wouldn't mean anything. He said, if I had the faith to move mountains, and that means that if you had the ability when you were in a meeting or in a situation where everybody was boxed in, it seems there's no way out, and this suggestion, that suggestion, Paul said, if you had the ability to see through that and the faith to find answers in that situation, he said, that would be big and important, wouldn't it? We've all been there, boxed in. He said, but if I even could move that mountain as a tremendous leader, he said, if I don't have love, it doesn't mean a thing in the world. You have nothing. And then he says, if I give all I possess, verse three, to the poor and give my body to hardships that I may boast, but do not have love, I am nothing. Listen, what's he saying? Take everything you've got, everything I've got, and we give it to the poor people. They have less, they have nothing. We just empty all of our resources say, here. I give it all to you. Boy, we would say, man, there's a Christian. Boy, that person really sees something. I so admire this kind of sacrificial living. Paul said, even if you do that, you don't get one point with God, one point with God. And if I go out and I become a martyr for the faith, I stand up when everybody else is sitting down and I stand for God in Christ on this biblical principle and I am martyred, he said that doesn't amount to anything yet either. Because he's talking about motivation, ladies and gentlemen, when you check motivation, well, Edwin, why do you preach sermons? Huh. Oh, why do you sing solos? Huh. Why do you give money? Whoa. You know, why do you visit the sick? Hello. Why, why do you listen to people? Why do you counsel? Why do you reach out? Why do, you, why do we do all these wonderful things that we do in the body of church? But if we do it without love, it's just noise, 
has no meaning, no significance. And let me give you a little simple illustration. It's from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Spurgeon said there was a great king, and a man had a little garden, and in his garden he'd had for many generations in his family, suddenly there appeared a large carrot. And it was so beautiful, he said, I'm going to give that to the king. And he took the carrot and he went into the throne room and told the king because he admired him and he loved him as his monarch, this is the finest thing that he's ever seen produced in his garden and he wanted the king to have it. And the king expressed his gratitude and the man turned to go out and the king says, wait a minute, I see that you're somebody I can trust. Next to your little garden, I've got a thousand acres of land that I never used. I want to give it to you and let you use it, and your garden can become a beautiful farm. And the man was overwhelmed. Well, a nobleman was listening in. He said, huh, for carrot, he got a thousand acres. Woo, I raise horses. And he said, man, I've just had this beautiful stallion. I'm going to give that to the king. And so he took that stallion to the king. He said, king, I, I so honor you. I want you to have the most magnificent steed that I have ever bred in my farm. I want it to be yours. The king says, I see through you. You saw a carrot for a thousand acres and a beautiful horse. You thought I'd give you more. You brought that horse to me for yourself and not for me. Now that's a simple story, a simple story. But we have to be so careful about our motivation. And without this agape love flowing through your life and my life, all of this stuff becomes nonsense. But when that agape love is flowing, man, beautiful things happen, especially in the body of Christ. And then we get a clear definition of what love is. You say, well, what is this love? He tells us clearly. Look at verse, verse number four. He said, love is patient. Time out. We go to church, we hear words. Oh, love is patient. Well, I'm not patient. Listen, stay around patience for a while. Love, this kind of supernatural love is patient. Man, I looked at that and said, oh, Lord, I've got a million miles to go. Love is patient. And then love is kind. Don't you love to be around people who are just genuinely kind, genuinely thoughtful, genuinely listen? Love is kind. Are you kind? Am I kind? Am I patient? Are you patient? See, we have to take this and let the Lord work in your life and in my life. And then he tells us what love is not. It does not boast. Hmm. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Oh, I have a temper. No, no, no. Love is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Man, you know, this, that, that's the third time he's done that. I'm telling, no, no, no. Remember, I thought about Peter. He went to Jesus trying to brag. He said, Jesus, are we to forgive people seven times? That was a big thing. Jesus said, oh, no, 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 no. You know, you, you to give people seven times 70, 40, 90 times, and it, there's no end to forgiveness. We do not keep a record. We just are a forgiving people. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. Do you ever delight sometime in somebody who had cut you down, neglected you, deceived you, exploited you, and you hear that, boy, <laughs> she got what she had coming to her? That ever happen? Oh, yeah. Delight in evil. And then it says, it is always protective. In other words, we said, this is what love is. This is what love is not. This is what love does. 
It is always protects. It always protects. Love always puts an umbrella over people. I like that. We're protected. Love is protective. It's protective. This is what love is. Patient kind. This is what love is not. And then we see what love does. It is protective. It's always protective. It always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Do you see how high this is, but how magnificent it is? What does that operate in your family, in this church, in relationships? Would anything be different? By the way, this is what heaven is like. It's just full of agape. It's full of love, full of joy, full of celebration. So we see Paul says very clearly, if I have all this, don't have, I have love, doesn't mean a thing. He uses hyperbole. Then he says, this is what love is. This is what love is not. And this is what love does. He gives us four things. And then he says something that's boom, over the top, staggering. Listen to this. Love never fails. Your translation might say something else. It, it's, it may say love never ends. It may say even love never falls. That's a strange word, isn't it? But, but love never does fall. We talked about falling in love, but love never falls away. Love just keeps on coming. The more we practice love, we don't run out of it. The more love we get. Begin to move with the Holy Spirit in your life, in my life, in these areas. Amazing things begin to happen. It's supernatural. Love never fails, never ends, never falls away. The more you use it, the more you begin to get in this agape sense. And then he moves on and explains it even clearer. He says, but there are, when there are prophecies, by the way, prophecy used in the Bible is used to foretell the future, and it's used to tell forth. Prophecy is more proclamation than it is prediction by the future. When you see the word, pro well, they're predicting, no, no, it's proclamation. He says, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, maybe glossolalia there, they'll be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Then I'll love this ninth verse. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears, and he mentions part again down in next to the last verse. In other words, everything we have now is in parts. Here, we got a part of this, we know a part of this, we've experienced a part of this. It's like having a giant puzzle. Then Paul says, look at that word, when completeness comes, remember 1 John? We, we obey the Lord, we get the love of God, and that love completes us. Or oh, when maturity comes, your word may say perfection. What does that mean? All these parts with agape love that begin to come together, and there is a completeness there, there is a maturity there, there is a perfection there, and all of a sudden, you and I, in Christ, begin to function and live in a way we never thought possible. That's what happens to us when completeness comes. You see, all life begins to come together, and there's maturity there. There's an understanding there. And this part I didn't get over here in my life Boy, I begin to see how it fits over here. And that which I could not comprehend and that which I thought was terrible, all that completeness comes there. And then he talks about what this maturity is. He talks about child, children. He said, but we know in part and when we prophesy in part, but when completeness, there's our word, comes, what is in part disappears. Then he says, when I was a child, 
I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man or a woman, bar mitzvah, whatever, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Listen, when I was a little guy, I played marbles. A lot of you, maybe you got it. I played marbles. I'd climb trees. I built forts. Man, I fought everybody that would come by. I had a little sword. I was a child. You know, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. I lived like a child. Nothing wrong with that. But you know what? When they showed me a football and a basketball and a baseball, you know, I didn't spend time shooting marbles or building forts or climbing trees. I just, that was all behind me. It was over. That's what happens to us in Christ. We grow up, we mature, and there's a completeness there. There is a wholeness there. That's what agape does to us. That's when our motivations get proper. That's when our motivations become pure. That's when our motivations in life become knowledgeable to God. He says, that's my boy, that's my gal, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my family. Completeness comes. And then he moves on in this passage, and he says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, another one of those parts, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. In other words, by the way, Corinth made mirrors. They were known for mirrors. They would take steel and shine it, and they would look at it, and you would see an image, a partial image. And in that day, they would take bone, and that's what windows were made out of bone. You could see out, but it was blurry. You could see an image in that polished steel, but not clearly. But Paul says, once we'll see face to face. Face. You see a picture, then you see face to face. Boy, that's something. That's the anticipation of us graduating and being with God, and somehow, some way, we have an image, we have an experience with God in Christ, but one day we'll see face to face, and as we have known, we begin to know. The word know in the Bible is an intimate word, a relationship word. Adam knew Eve. Boy, that's intimacy. And to know, it says, as we have been known intimately, so we begin to know intimately, and we'll see face to face, and we'll get assignments from God all the way through eternity. And then the last little verse here is a powerful verse. And now these three remain, faith, Hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, wait a minute. You mean we're going to have to have faith in heaven? It remain, remains, and these three remains. Absolutely. Because in heaven, you see, we're not just float around with our wings, folks. I'm sorry to tell you that. That's not going to be the agenda. In heaven, we're going to be able to fulfill all that we didn't get to fulfill on this earth. Man, all, all of it. And he goes, and we have to have faith that, boy, the next eon that we'll have, what God will give us faith to grow and expand. We don't shrivel up. We don't say the same. That's the faith is an act. We have hope of we can't imagine what will be. C.S. Lewis said if we met somebody we've known all of our life, and bang, we'd be before them in heaven. It would be such a magnificent specimen that we want to bow down and worship because there's a whole new resurrection body there, a whole new resurrected life there. We'll know as we've been known, and we'll have to have faith, and we'll have to have hope, and we will have to have love because all of heaven's domain is filled with agape love. Can you imagine it? You know, I thought about just taking people out of the audience here and bringing somebody and say, man, just love this person completely, love that. And we just go around, and boy, if that was an atmosphere, whew, it'd be fire and lightning. 
joy and celebration. We, we walk in one another's shoes. We pour ourselves into another life. Man, that agape love is overwhelming. And by the way, remember, this is the way. We're trying to find the way, aren't we? We GPS sent to God. He said, the way you live and walk is love. I can't do it but he begins to love us and that love flows in my life and your life and it flows out in the lives of others. It is something we do. It's action. When we decide to live our life God's way.